Well, good evening, everybody. It is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, and that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study, and we greet you this afternoon from Huntsville, Alabama, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're happy that uh, you've chosen to be with us, I hope that in the next 90 minutes or so, you will uh, hear something that will inspire you, encourage you, help you in your spiritual journey, whether you're straight, gay, uh, cross-eyed or blind, as I like to say. Um, I guarantee you, there is something in this study for everybody. Uh, as I've explained before, we're in, our, we're in the process of our uh, series, LGBT Affirming Theology. Uh, a lot of people might see that title and you assume, well, you know, that, that's for LGBT Christians. That's really not for me. No, 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 no. Not by a million miles. Um, when you, as I've explained before, when you misunderstand something uh, and you understand it incorrectly, then that means there is some application that you're not getting, that you need to get. So if you're understanding it wrongly, then that means there's something missing in, in uh, your understanding. So, you know, so... Uh, as we go through this, there is something for everybody. Also, when I teach, I don't know about how others teach. I, you know, folks, I, um, I'm very different in the way I do things, and I know I am. I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just different. Um, when I teach, I oftentimes go into the mechanics of study. In other words, I talk about uh, the process. I talk about how we should go about studying the Word of God. Most teachers and preachers you see on television, uh, on the internet, they get in front of a camera and they just start barking like they're the, uh, you know, almighty, they're the supreme authority, you know, and they just start quote-unquote teaching. And uh, what they don't teach, however, is uh, how we effectively study the Word of God. Why do I teach the way I do? Well, I teach the way I do because I study the way I do, you know. And so there are important lessons uh, that people never get taught. I never got taught growing up as a kid in the Pentecostal church. Nobody ever taught me half the stuff that I talk about in terms of the mechanics of Bible study, okay? You know, for instance, you often hear me talk about line upon line, precept upon precept, you know. You hear me talk about um, Paul telling Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I've talked about rightly dividing. I've talked about keeping... Uh, passages in context. I've talked about uh, understanding the context of the times. So as you're reading, you know, and all these factors that, that I often talk about when I'm teaching, most teachers never go into any of this. They, they don't talk about, well, the reason is they don't do any of this. That's the problem. You know, they take something complex. I've never grown up as a kid. Oh, my Lord, preachers would take a passage so out of context to make a point. And uh, even when I was young, and when I was a young preacher, believe it or not, that used to drive me nuts. Oh, that drove me crazy. I don't like, I don't like it when somebody pulls something completely out of context uh, to make a point. And uh, I see a lot of times when I'm watching these TV preachers and online preachers, you know, I constantly see this, and, and it really gets on my last nerve. So tonight, 
before we get into the meat of continuing our study, I'm going to do a real quick little uh, breakdown on another aspect of study that I think will help us to understand as we study the Word of God why we go about it the way we do it, uh, why I break things down the way I do. Because there are a lot of people who watch me teach, for instance, and I'm sure they're sitting back saying, well, bless God, he just not letting the Word of God say what the Word of God says. You know, he tried to break it, you know, every other way. No, there's a reason for this, okay? But before we get into this, before we get started tonight, let's go to the Lord in prayer. You never want to engage in uh, reading or studying the Word of God without first approaching it prayerfully. Because unlike most books, we have the benefit of the author sitting with us, and uh, he has volunteered his input to help us understand what we're reading by His Spirit. And we want the Spirit of the Lord to lead us and help us to understand what we're reading because after all, in effect, He wrote it, okay? Master, we love you, God, tonight. We thank you, Lord, for another Wednesday night, the opportunity to be in your presence, to break the bread of life for the benefit and the nourishment of God's people. Let the holy anointing from heaven rest upon your teacher tonight, O oh God, and let it rest upon each and every hearer as well. Allow our hearts, Lord, to be cultivated, to be ready to receive that which the Word of God would impart unto our soul at this hour. Help us to be receptive, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all tonight in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, we did have a two-week uh, break in our study. Um, week one, two weeks ago, I had to go to my uncle's uh, memorial event up home in the Northeast. Uh, so we didn't have a Bible study that Wednesday. And then last Wednesday, of course, was Thanksgiving Eve, and I really hadn't thought about it until like Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. And I kind of realized, I said, you know, a lot of people are going to be busy. People are baking and cooking and uh, traveling and what have you. And uh, one thing that I get concerned about is I don't want people to be so busy that they miss it, not even miss it live per se, because a lot of people don't necessarily watch it live each week, but they'll come back later and watch it recorded, you know, and that's fine. But with the holiday and everything, I didn't want to put out a Bible study and then have people all week being so busy that basically they just forget about that week's Bible study altogether and then wind up missing it in total whether it be live or whether it be going back and looking at it later. I didn't want to do that because it's too important. If you're watching this series, it's too important that you see each and every successive session. Okay? All right. Now I want to do a quick, a quick breakdown. Again, this has to do with study technique, why I teach the way I teach, why you should study the Word of God carefully and studiously. I want to talk a little bit at the moment about the concept of rightly dividing the Word of God. I've talked about it before, but I won't talk about it again. Say, preacher, why do you repeat things every once in a while? Uh, I'll tell you why. Because people forget things every once in a while. And the way to help people cement important concepts in their thinking is through repetition. What? Um, somebody's asking about the sound. You don't have the light to do. You? The sound? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Um, Just check. Testing one. Yeah, I don't see the. Let me see. Whoops, nope. Okay. Let me see. 
Hello. There you go. Okay, sorry. Thank now you. we should... I'm sorry, folks. I've been talking, and apparently there was no sound. I apologize for that. Oh, well, I, I'm not going to go back and repeat everything that I've said. Um, we missed two-week study. I had to go to my uncle's memorial a couple of Wednesdays ago. I had to go up home for that. And then last week was Thanksgiving. I didn't want to put a Bible study out there, have most people miss it live, and then because of the festivities and the long weekend and what have you, not wind up going back and catching the session that they missed. This is too important a series, so I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we didn't have something out there that people were going to miss. So, I want to start out this week, I just want to talk for a few minutes on the concept of uh, rightly dividing the Word of God and why when we study and when I teach, why I teach the way I teach and why we study the way we study. Uh, rightly dividing the Word of God is an extremely important principle. The Apostle Paul told uh, Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, it is too easy to butcher scripture and uh, to pull things out of context and, and to read things without any concept of uh, the context of the times and the circumstances around what's being written. Uh, you know, it's, it's too easy to be lackadaisical in our approach of the study of God's Word. We can act like God just dropped words out of heaven, you know, and every passage stands alone. But that is a falsehood, okay? That is not truthful, that is not right, that is not what the Word of God teaches. Rightly dividing the Word of God is extremely important. Now, I want to give you an example tonight of what I'm talking about. Uh, for instance, there are two Hebrew words which are used uh, in the King James that are translated judge. There is a Hebrew word, shafat, and a Hebrew word, din. The Greek, mind you, uses only one word with many various applications and specific meanings. So now the Hebrew has two different words that are translated judge. And each of those terms has its own unique, specific definition. Shafat is the most commonly used, uh, as it appears several times in the Word of God, especially in the book of Joshua. In Joshua 2, 23, it says, And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age now, mind you, we recall that before the kings ruled the nation of Israel, judges governed the land. And judges, or uh, shafats, administer justice by pronouncing sentence over the accused. Another Hebrew word for judge is din. The verb din is also, quote, to judge, but in the idea of ruling or regulating. For instance, like how an umpire regulates or rules. Now, obviously, there's a world of difference between how a judge judges in a courtroom and how an umpire judges during the course of a ball game, okay? So in Hebrew, you've got two different words that are both translated in the, in the King James judge. Now, it is often the case that many Christians will try 
to interpret and apply each individual passage from the Word of God as though it has a mandate or a message standing alone. Many will also try to apply the identical word definition or use in every instance in the Word of God where a particular word appears. This is dangerous. Now again, there's a reason I'm going into this and I'll bring it out later as we talk about our primary topic. In other words, just because the same word appears in a given translation, and generally in the King James translation, that does not mean that that word is being used in the same way. In the Greek, for instance, there's one word that is translated judge, and yet that one word has seven unique definitions. So you can go through and you can say, well, you know, this passage says judge, and this passage says judge, and this passage, and you can try to act like they're all saying the same thing because they're using the same word, but they are not. And, again, talking about rightly dividing the Word of God. The easiest way to understand how that word is being used, especially in the New Testament Greek uh, writings, is through context. Same thing is true often in the Old Testament uh, writings, the Hebrew. Context. Look at the context in which that word is used, okay? Now, I have some examples for us tonight using the word, for instance, judge. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, the term judge is krino, a Greek word, krino, it's a verb. It can mean, one, to separate, put asunder, to pick out, select, or choose. So you judge which piece of fruit is rotten or which piece of fruit is uh, ripe. You know, when you go to the store, you pick out, you choose. You're judging, okay? It also can mean to approve, esteem, or prefer. So... You, you judge when you show somebody preference or you hold somebody in high esteem. You're making a judgment concerning them. Now, judge can also mean to be of an opinion, to deem, think, or to be of an opinion. Number four, to determine, resolve, or decree. So, I judged it necessary to do thus and so. I resolved that it was necessary I do something, okay? So you can see already, the word judge here has way more uses than simply to sit in judgment, okay? Uh, five, to judge in the classical sense, meaning to pronounce an opinion concerning right and wrong, to be judged, or summoned to trial that one's case may be examined and judgment passed upon it. To pronounce judgment, to subject to censure. So, in the passage we've just read, the Lord is talking about this very thing. You don't pronounce judgment. You don't make declarations of judgment. Concern. Oh, he's going to split hell wide open. I grew up hearing that all the time. You know, Boy, that one there, he's just going to split hell wide open. Um, how do you know that? You don't know that. that. That's not your call to make. Do you follow? Okay? But there are any number of other word uses, all right, that uh, for the word that is translated judge, which is krino in the Greek. If you read Romans 14, 10 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes, But why dost thou judge thy brother? 
or why dost thou send at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. In this passage, in the last verse, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. And then he says, But judge this rather. Both of those words are being used differently. First he's talking about pronouncing judgment. Right? First he's talking about making a judgment. Pronouncing. Then he said, But judge this rather. Then he says, but make a determination. So there's a whole different use here, yet it's the same identical word. Now, what's interesting is this passage begins with the, verb, the words, Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? The word not is a Greek word which is literally translated, very simple translation. It is a verb which means to make of no account or to despise utterly. In this instance, <coughs> excuse me, at the beginning of this passage, the Apostle Paul is using the term judge and it can clearly be seen that he means to separate or to put asunder by reason of the context of the passage. How do we know that? Read it in context. He said, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Are you following? So he literally is first using the word judge, but one of the uses, one of the definitions for the word judge is to utterly despise, or, or um, excuse me, I'm sorry, <laughs> to separate or to put asunder. So the fact that Paul says Or why dost thou set it not? The context is bringing out which definition he's using, which uh, meaning he's applying when he uses the word judge. Do you follow what I'm saying? Uh, he's almost being a little bit repetitive, almost being a little bit redundant in that he's saying, don't judge, why are you setting it not? Because in this sense, both of them are saying basically the same thing. But... By doing this, he's clarifying which usage of the word judge he's using. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? This is why it is so important, folks, that we rightly divide the word of God and we not be careless in how we uh, pull things apart and interpret things. So Paul first saying judge followed by the term said it not, we can clearly understand the specific use of the word judge in this passage. As is often the case, the specific use of a, a word can be clearly understood by considering the context in which it appears. In John chapter 7, verse 24, the Lord said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now reading this passage in context, I haven't read the entire passage. I haven't read it in context for time's sake, okay? But when you read it in context, you see that the Lord had delivered a demoniac on the Sabbath. Many of the rulers condemned him for doing so. His answer 
don't pronounce judgment as to what is right or wrong based solely upon the visible circumstance, but consider all the pertinent factors so as to make a right judgment. So in this instance, the Lord is using the word judge, but he's actually using the fifth definition of the word to judge or to pronounce an opinion concerning what is right or wrong. Okay? Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? You know how many times I've heard Christians try to pull this passage out and say, see, the Apostle Paul said we need to judge because one day we're going to judge the angels. And they try to use this as a justification for judging in the sense of making a proclamation of what is wrong or right, so on and so forth. But the context of this passage makes it abundantly clear that the use of the word judge here refers specifically to the sixth available definition of the Greek word translated judge, which is to rule or govern, to preside over with the power of giving judicial decisions because it was the prerogative of kings and rulers to pass judgment, to contend together of warriors and combatants, to dispute in a forensic sense, to go to law or to have suit at law. So what Paul was actually saying in this sense, he's not talking about making judgments. He's not talking about, you know, declaring right or wrong. No, he's literally talking in a legal sense. If there's a dispute, then isn't there somebody in the church? Isn't there somebody uh, in the faith? who could preside over that matter to make a judgment, okay, rather than going to a court of law where you're going to be in front of people who are not going to be making legal uh, judgments based upon Christian principle or the word of God, but rather strictly upon the law of the land. So do you follow the difference? So you see, I've just given you three different instances where the word judge is used, and yet in each instance there's a whole different meaning that is applied to the word judge. You're able to understand which meaning is used simply by keeping the passage in context. As long as you look at it in context, then there is no uh, confusion. If I send my child to college with the admonishment, I don't want you to behave like the majority of college students behave. I do not want you spending all night partying and drinking. I don't want you spending time on romantic pursuits. But rather, I want you to spend your time on academic endeavors. And then if I say, do not beat mistreat, talk down to, or verbally or physically abuse other students, as is the custom in a college environment. Now, having said that, unless you understand what I mean by, I don't want you to be mistreat, talk down to, or verbally or physically abuse, you may assume, hearing those words, well, that's easy. I would never do such a thing. I wouldn't talk down to anybody. I wouldn't abuse anybody. I wouldn't mistreat anybody. But if you understand that I am specifically referring to, listen now, the common practice in schools of higher learning 
for upperclassmen to haze lower classmen who seek to become part of a fraternity, then you will fully understand exactly what I mean. So I'm not just saying I don't want you to do these things out of the clear air. I'm not just saying that out of thin air. No, I know my kid, my kid, I raised my child to be moral. I raised my child to be decent. I don't expect my kid is going to run around verbally abusing people, mistreating people, beating people, doing things. But my child could get caught up in hazing. He could join a fraternity, and then when they start hazing other students, you know, who are coming into the fraternity, my kid could get caught up in that. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because it, in, in that context, it's an entirely different thing. Then you're just going along with the crowd. Then it's, oh, but it's just tradition. Oh, this is just what we do. Do you follow what I'm saying? So... In order to really understand why I would give my kid these instructions, you have to understand why am I saying this specifically. I wasn't saying that simply because I didn't trust my kid to treat people right. No, I was saying that because I know that college kids can get caught up in the uh, practice of hazing. And I don't want my kid doing that. Even... even uh, even as part of the college ritual, you know, uh, it's inappropriate. You, you, don't, you don't talk down to people. You don't mistreat people. You don't abuse people, even in that environment. So it's important to understand the context and the circumstances around by saying those specific words. While I may be able to trust you, to honor your upbringing by not randomly abusing or mistreating other students, I may feel it necessary to, specif to specifically speak to those practices associated with hazing, as young people can easily get caught up in these things as part of the fraternity experience. All right, Pastor, now why did you, we're talking about rightly dividing the Word of God. Why did you share these things? Now, I want to go back to Leviticus. I want to go back to the Law of Moses. You remember, I kept talking about, as we've been studying this, the Lord was continually, constantly reminding Moses with these words or similar words. Leviticus 20, 22 through 23. Keep all my decrees and laws and follow them so that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. You must not live according to the customs of the nations I am going to drive out before you. Because they did all these things, I abhorred them. So, when we look at the Old Testament laws, we have to understand there is context that must be considered. How do we know that? Because the Lord says over and over again, I don't want you doing the customs of these people. I don't want you acting the way these people act. I don't want you embracing the conduct that these people embrace. So then, therefore, when you're reading some of these laws, it can be like me giving my college student, you know, I don't want you beating, mistreating, you know. And if you're hearing those words, you may think you understand what it's meaning. When in reality, you're not understanding at all because I'm saying that for a very specific purpose reason. And I'm specifically referring to the practice of hazing. I'm not just talking in general, because honestly, I have no question in my mind that my kid is going to act right, and it's not generally going to do these things. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, now, let's move forward. 
<clears throat> as we're looking at uh, homosexuality in the Old Testament. Old Testament prohibition spoke expressly of same-sex sexual encounters which were of a religious sort or an idolatrous sort after the practices of the worshipers of false gods. Leviticus 20.13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. You remember last time in our uh, discussion of this, we talked about the fact that the use of the term abomination in this specific instance points us immediately in the direction of idolatry. So he's not talking about just quote-unquote sexual practice. No, he's talking about sexual practice that is specifically associated with idolatry. Okay? The case in point for our reasoning relative to idolatrous sexual encounters can be found in the literal translation of this particular verse which brings so many to a place of fear and judgment. In this passage, Moses makes a distinction between a man, a male, and the type of man that he is lying with. It says a man shall not lie with mankind. It doesn't say a man shall not lie with a man, meaning simply a male with a male. The second term translated in the King James Version as mankind literally comes from the Hebrew word zakar. This word specifically speaks of an individual who is, quote, to be remembered or to be held up in high esteem or high regard, such as a religious priest. Therefore, Moses was clearly stating that a man or any man should not lie with a remembered, esteemed, held up individual, a leader, a priest, as he would lie with a woman. The only reason people in biblical times would do such a thing was when they were trying to secure the fertility of their crops, their herds, etc. It required that they do something that was completely unnatural to them. Imagine how sickening it must have been to a straight male to have to handle the male genitalia, speaking plainly, folks, of the priest in an effort to sexually arouse him enough to bring about climax. I mean, think about it. If, if that's not something you do, if that's not something you have any interest in, honey, that, that's not going to be the easiest thing in the world to do. But these fertility religions, these idols that were based on fertility gods, this is the exact type of behavior that they engaged in. Can you imagine? So uh, the Lord is saying, I don't want you engaging in these idolatrous sexual practices, okay? Uh, anyone not of a homosexual orientation would likely find this experience anything but pleasant. But they would see it as necessary if they were to secure the blessings of their idol or their god. Mind you, even if the person were homosexual, they're not doing this out of any kind of attraction. They're not doing this because they're the least bit interested in the other person. So it would be equally as offensive to them. You know? Um, I don't know about you, but in my life, especially when I was younger, I had a few old pruned up fellas come on to me, you know? 
and I wasn't the least bit interested in them, and I wasn't, the, you know, I wasn't the least bit attracted or anything. And how terrible would it have been if I were part of one of these fertility uh, uh, idolatrous religions, and that guy happened to be my priest? Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay, so uh, no matter how you slice it, these practices went entirely against nature. They went entirely against, had nothing in the world to do with attraction, had nothing in the world to do with intimacy. No, it basically was a business transaction is what it amounted to, which is why the... Um, the priests that engaged in these things and the people that they employed in these temples to uh, perform these rituals with people were referred to as temple prostitutes because it was, in effect, a business transaction, okay? In another application, the term Zakar can also speak of one who is of great position and power. It was common in biblical times for men of war. Biblical times, they still do it. This went on at uh, Guantanamo, right down here in Cuba. Um, they have it on record, American soldiers pulling this kind of garbage. But it was common in biblical times for men of war to rape their opponent's leaders, after securing a victory as a means of degrading and humiliating the defeated enemy. I don't know if you recall, some of you may be too young to recall, but some years back uh, there were reports of American soldiers forcing their Islamic prisoners to engage in sexual, same-sex sexual acts as a means of humiliating and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, trying to break them down, okay? And uh, this is the sort of activity that goes back to antiquity. This garbage has been done for millennium, okay, as a means of humiliating. Uh, Anyone familiar with the infamous exploits of Caligula will remember how that he, in the spirit and tradition of the idolatrous religions of pagan Rome, would use same-sex sexual exploits as a means of torturing, humiliating, and demoralizing his opponents. And mind you, Caligula... <laughs> was active, his reign, it was short, it was only a few years, but it literally was in the time period just after basically the Lord ascended. Okay? So when Paul wrote his book to the Romans, and he spoke of all these ungodly activities that the Romans had committed themselves to as part of their idolatrous practice, Caligula had just left the scene. He hadn't been gone very long. And the practices of Rome were known worldwide. Their reputation was all over the world, okay? So, uh, God taught his people that they were not to behave in this fashion either. When they won a battle and secured a victory, they were able to walk away with the spoils, but they were not to treat Zakar, a notable person or someone to be remembered, someone to be held up, someone who is to be uh, held in high esteem, someone who is notable, etc., as they would a common prostitute. So again, you still have that same concept, that same practice uh, in the religious, idolatrous sense, but then you also have it even in the uh, 
sense of humiliating an enemy, okay, and demoralizing an enemy. All right. To do so was detestable. Or acting as one who served an idol god idolatrously rather than as one who served the living king of Israel. Now, for an example, if you look at the story of Saul in 1 Samuel 31, verses 6 through 10, so Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. And the next day when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shem. Now, after being mortally wounded in battle, Saul begged his servants to kill him before the heathen Philistines showed up to claim their spoils and, quote-unquote, abuse him, literally meaning in this case to sexually rape him as a means of demoralizing and humiliating he and the Israeli people. When the armor bearer could not kill the king, Saul opted to end his own life, only to shortly thereafter have his body claimed by the Philistines, his head cut off, and his remains paraded around the various idolatrous temples of the Philistine gods as a trophy of their victory. All right, so you see, there's, there are two different ways the car can be applied, but there is a very specific uh, point being made by the Lord here. He's not just talking about a man with a man. No, that's not what he's talking about. And when you don't understand that, then you don't understand that uh, there is something important here that is being overlooked. When we talk about idolatrous sexual practice, people sleeping with or having sexual encounters with someone who is notable or someone uh, in a place of power or authority, we look at that today and we say, well, but, you know, we don't have religions in the world today that do that. No, we don't. But... But people still engage in this same basic type of sexual conduct. And someone said, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? People still engage. And people still, listen carefully now, people still will sleep with somebody or have a sexual encounter with somebody who's in a position of power or authority, someone notable, someone in high esteem, highly regarded, in an effort to attain something through them or from them. You ever heard of the old saying, the casting couch? I'm going to get into this when we get into the New Testament because Paul literally... Uh, coined a phrase in the New Testament that is often used against LGBT people, but he literally coined a phrase, he created a phrase that literally meant to, uh, he put two words together, to elevate or to lift and a couch or a bed. 
okay, using a bed or a couch in order to attain elevation or some advantage, okay? Now, in the case, for instance, of the casting couch, a young actress or a young actor may sleep with the uh, director, may sleep with somebody who's producing a film. That is a car. That is someone who is notable. That is someone in a position of power, authority. Are they sleeping with that person because they have any interest in them whatsoever romantically? No. They're doing it the same way they would sleep with a hooker, the same way they would sleep with a prostitute. It's a business transaction. They are doing it whether it goes against everything in them to do it so that they can achieve some advantage. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you see what I mean when I say if we misunderstand certain passages, then by not understanding what it's really saying, we wind up loosening out because there is something there. And, and somebody might say, well, Pastor, you know, uh, why do I need to know that? You know, I'm not an actor. I'm not an actress. Folks, there are people every day. I went through about six months of hell on wheels in... Um, Atlanta, Georgia, many years ago before I went to Dallas. I went to Atlanta, and man, I never had such a hard time in my life as I did in Atlanta. I had a man who had offered for me to stay with him if I would come start a work in Atlanta. I'd been on the phone with him, you know, every day leading up to my packing up my car, packing up a U-Haul, driving to Atlanta. And I had been on the phone with him and everything. You know, it's not like I, I didn't talk to him for weeks on end. The day I arrived in Atlanta, I showed up at this guy's house. And he said, oh, well, you know what, Charles? I, I've started a new relationship with somebody, so I'm not going to be able to have you stay here after all. I had... No income, had no money, had no job, had nothing. All of a sudden now, I have nowhere to stay. And I'm in a city, all of my stuff, I brought it down in a U-Haul, put it in storage. I had to live out of my car, folks, for about a month. And it was hot. My God, Atlanta is one of the hottest, most miserable places in the world. There was one bar in town that used to have, on certain nights or what have you, uh, during their happy hour, you know, they'd have food out and stuff. That's all I had to eat. If it wasn't for that place, I'd have gone hungry. It, I went through, oh, I went through a terrible time. Nobody in that town would help me for nothing. Nobody, not a soul. They didn't care to help me no kind of way. But I had people offer to help me if I would just do this or that. And I told them, I don't do the car. Okay? I don't sleep with people. I don't perform sexual acts with people in order to gain some kind of advantage or in order to get something from them. If I'm not genuinely invested in a relationship with that person, there's no way in the world. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't. So I stayed in my car. And, uh, and it, it was hard. I mean, I went through hell on wheels. But that is how committed I was to my principles, okay? And I've had, I had a man some years ago in our church in Dallas who was in the habit of finding young men, to be frank, I'm going to talk plain, who were really in a bad way. They were homeless, you know, what have you. I don't know where the devil he found them at, but he found them. And he would invite them to stay with him, and then he would turn around and he would extract favors. I'm just being plain and simple, okay? And I'm going to tell you, if you think this preacher 
doesn't stand up for what's right, you don't know me very well because he and I had a talk. And I told him, I said, that is wrong conduct. You do not ever use your power or your authority or your position in order to glean sexual favors from somebody that is the card. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So this is why I say understanding what God was saying in the Leviticus is important because this kind of conduct does go on in the modern world. You know, you've seen stories of starlets and actresses who marry, you know, these guys who are as old as Methuselah and they're all wrinkled up and gross and disgusting and they got this pretty young starlet on their arm. She's only doing it for one thing. When he dies, she gets all his money. She's being a prostitute. She is prostituting herself. And that is a card. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay? So yes, there is a very real application to be gleaned from this passage, but it is not what we're commonly, most frequently told that it is. The term used in Leviticus 20 verse 13 for woman is not the Hebrew word, which simply means a member of the female gender, but rather it is a term which speaks of any woman, a common prostitute, or a woman whom you need not know anything about. So, when he said, shall, a man shall not lie with mankind, a male shall not lie with the sakkar, as he would a common prostitute, or a woman that he doesn't need to do anything about. Do you follow? There's no investment. There's, there's no relationship. There is no interest. There's no romance. There's nothing. It is just a business transaction. Therefore, the real prohibition here is as much on the intent of the encounter as it is the nature of the two parties engaging in this conduct. A man would have sex with a male temple prostitute or a priest representing a fertility god or a phallic religion the same way as one would have sex with a prostitute. You come, do your business, and you go home. It's a business transaction. Promiscuity at its best. No caring, no love, no commitment. God told his people that they were not to conduct themselves in this careless a fashion. Whether it is with a religious notable figure or a fallen foe or monarch. If you've ever, if you've never had the opportunity, I recommend a book written by a friend of mine, a wonderful Christian man who's a member of the LGBT community. I've known Sam for a great number of years, and he's a real sweet-spirited man. Uh, he's been ministering in the LGBT community now for, good Lord, I don't even know how long, 40 years or better. Uh, his name is Sam Cater, K-A-D-E-R. And Sam wrote a book some years ago called Openly Gay, Openly Christian. Uh, it is a pretty, uh, it's an easy read. And he goes through all the clobber passages in the Bible and expounds upon them and breaks them down for folks. And I'm going to quote from his book for a moment. Um, you can find that, by the way, on Amazon or what have you. Uh, I think you might have to buy it used. I'm not sure if it's in print at this time. But uh, on page 50, paragraph 4 of Sam's book, Openly Gay, Openly Christian, How the Bible Really Is Gay-Friendly, uh, Sam writes, quote, All the things condemned in Leviticus 18 and 20 were what the idolatrous nations were doing. 
they did treat Zakar to be remembered as if he were a common prostitute and did it in the name of idolatrous religion, end quote. All right, so there's your, there's your Old Testament law prohibitions that are commonly, you know, pointed to. And people say, oh, bless God, you know. It, it says right there, man shall not lie with a man, bless God, you know. And these people don't even know what they're talking about. They have no clue what they're talking about. All they're doing is reading the words on the page. They're not, they're not investing any effort in the universe in genuinely trying to understand what God was communicating, okay? Uh, I've spoken with over the years, and I've done a lot of research on um, Jewish thought concerning these passages and uh, concerning a lot of the prohibitions within the law and what have you. And uh, rabbis uh, teach that it was understood, even in Moses' day, that many of the prohibitions that the Lord had concerning certain sexual acts had to do with the fact that the nation of Israel was a fledgling nation. They were going in about a million and a half, estimated at about a million and a half strong into the land of Canaan. And it was imperative for their national security and their survival as a nation that they uh, procreate like bunny rabbits, literally. That that's what that's what uh, that's why a lot of um, the prohibitions, like for instance, concerning acts like masturbation and you know things of that nature, uh, a man allowing his seed to fall upon the ground. All of these prohibitions. The reason they existed is God wanted the people of Israel to procreate, to increase their numbers as quickly as humanly possible because the survival of their nation depended upon their population growing. The more people you have, the more uh, you're able to have armies and the better you're able to protect yourself. Even when you look at many of the rules the Lord had, within the law of Moses concerning immigrants and people who wanted to come into Israel and become part of the nation of Israel. Interestingly enough, uh, the law of Moses provided for what amounted to open borders, which, you know, people in America, certain people in America, uh, want to gripe about every day. And there are principles that God understood that Republicans don't, and that is that the more people you have, then the stronger your economy, the more people you have, what does that mean? It means you need more businesses, you need more services, okay? Uh, it also means more security. You're able to have larger armies, okay? Um, you're able, the more people are working, the more taxes you can collect. I mean, when, if you understand how uh, the economy works, if you understand the principles of economics, then you understand that uh, a nation only grows stronger and uh, more secure as its population increases. This is why the nation of Canada has basically an open uh, immigrant policy. And they say, hey, yeah, if you want to come to Canada, come to Canada, we'll take you. Because they understand how it works. They understand economic principles. Got people in America don't have a clue. And so they gripe and groan about everything. But if you look at the laws that God laid forth for the nation of Israel, then you understand why in the world would the Lord tell them, if somebody wants to come in and be part of your country, you're to treat them as though they're native born. You're not to treat them any differently as someone who was born there. Why, why is God saying this, you know? Well, again, 
if you understand the context, then you understand the why and the wherefore. So if you see God can, if you see the Lord saying, I don't want men being with men because I don't want them wasting their seed. Okay, that's what it amounts to. I want, uh, I want procreation. I want to see you people, you know, constantly creating babies, constantly creating children for the sake of your security. Um, if you see the Lord saying, you know, I don't want uh, male seed being wasted, you know, that's the, because otherwise it would almost seem like, gee, God is obsessed with some of the craziest little, you know, little details, isn't he? And yet, one of the things that I've always found really interesting, I'm getting off track a little bit, a little bit, but not, not real bad. But I want to bring this point out because it's important to understand. According to the religions right in America, according to evangelicals and uh, fundamentalists, we serve the most uh, sex-obsessed God that ever was and ever will be. And yet, for all of God's sexual obsession, he never, ever voiced a problem with David and his hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines. Solomon and his hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines. Going back to Abraham, Abraham had a wife. God made a promise to Abraham that through Sarah a nation would be born that would bless the world and that he would be the father of many nations. And yet by the time it was all said and done, Abraham wound up having a child also with Sarah's handmaid. You go to Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You go to Jacob, who um, the nations of the, the tribes of the nation of Israel came forth from Jacob and his sons. Jacob had sons from four different women. But to hear the religious right tell it, you know, oh, it's always been one man, one woman, bless God, you know. And God hates immorality. God hates sex outside of marriage. God hates this. God hates that. Um, no. A lot of what we read in the, uh, the books outside of the Law of Moses concerning, uh, and again, folks, I just, uh, the only way I know how to talk is plain. I just don't know how to make it pretty. You know, when it talks about whoremongers and whores and, you know, things like that, uh, that is the wisdom of God. That is God instructing his people how to best live their lives. So when he says, don't do this and don't do that, it is not necessarily the Lord saying, you're going to go to hell if you do this. You're going to go to hell if you do that. No. But he's saying, you're going to screw up your life if you do this. You're going to screw up your You know, if I could give any advice to young people, straight or gay, I would tell you, once you open Pandora's box, which is becoming sexually active, you ain't never going to shut that box again, honey. And you don't know the emotional hurt and damage, not to mention the potential physical damage you can bring to your life through careless sexual conduct. So does this pastor encourage people to be promiscuous? Do I encourage people to go out there and you know do whatever they want with whoever they're not by a million miles? Am I going to stand here and say, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell? No, I'm not going to say that, but I am going to say, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. Take it from somebody who's been there. There is nothing that feels worse in the universe than somebody using you physically and then walking away from you the next time you see them, they act like they don't even know who you are. 
and they and you know and they know that they sure well know who you are. But they're not interested. You know, they're just getting their jollies and they're off and running. So is there value in waiting for marriage before becoming sexually active? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, <laughs> would, I, would I play the value of that down? Would I try to, make, you know, make out like that that's not a good thing? Not by a million miles. But at the same time, I'm not going to stand here and tell people that God is as obsessed with sex as so many on the right try to make us believe. No, if God were nearly as obsessed with all things sexual as the, the, the religious right tries to make us believe, man, he'd have struck down half the people in Scripture. Good Lord, Lot and his two daughters, no sooner did they get out of Sodom than they're deciding, hey, let's get daddy drunk and have sex with him so we can have babies so that he, his name, you know, his heritage can continue. What kind of insanity is that? The law of Moses clearly condemned that kind of conduct, right? That kind of incest. And yet, you, again, you don't see God punishing Lot for that. You know, you don't see God striking his daughters dead over it or sending disease to these people over these things. No. So the notion that God is as sexually obsessed is also erroneous. I will tell you this concerning the New Testament. I'm almost done tonight, so I'll kind of close up with this. Concerning the New Testament, the Jews had the law of Moses. The term morality is relative. People don't like when you say that. Some, some of you holiness folk out there, have, you're about ready to spit your teeth. Morality is not relative. Sure it is. Absolutely it is. Morality, by definition, means uh, that which is a social norm or generally accepted. Uh, one society uh, may accept certain things, whereas another society doesn't, okay? So yes, it is relative based upon the individual uh, society in which you live. My grandmother, many years ago, she loved this movie. Uh, I want to say it was called Hawaii. Very long movie, if I remember correctly. I think it was like four hours long or something. It's a real, real, real long movie. It was made back in the maybe 50s or 60s or something. I want to say that uh, uh, I, me and my memory, I want to say that uh, uh, The Sound of Music, Julie Andrews was in it. I might be wrong. But it was, it was about a missionary, Christian missionary, who went from England to Hawaii way back in the day and brought the gospel to the natives of Hawaii. Well, when he got to Hawaii, you know, the women are running around without any tops on. And uh, the king of the particular uh, tribe that he's trying to preach the gospel to is married to his sister because in their culture that was perfectly acceptable. And of course this guy was just, oh my God, this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen. This is terrible, this shouldn't be, blah, 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 blah. But morality is relative. In their culture, that was generally accepted. That, that They had no problem with that. I'm not saying I endorse it. I'm not saying I encourage it. I'm not saying I'm okay with it. But what I'm trying to say is that we oftentimes want to uh, push our concept of certain things on other people. Well, the apostles... When the Gentiles began to come into the church, the apostles had absolutely no experience 
none with non-Jewish audiences. And quite frankly, they were appalled. They were disgusted because when they looked at the cultures in a lot of the Gentile world, they were far less strict and far less rigid than the culture they knew as Jews, which had been framed by the law of Moses and uh, the law that God gave Moses on, on Mount Sinai. So what happens is, if you notice, the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by the four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't see a whole lot of writing in there at all about quote-unquote morality. You don't see them fighting social wars. You don't see them having all these uh, issues, you know, with uh, how people do things and what have you. But all of a sudden, when we get into the epistles, where the apostles are writing to the churches, you know, on various topics, all of a sudden there's this obsession with uh, sexuality. All of a sudden there's this obsession with immorality. All of a sudden there's this obsession with all these different behaviors and all these different conducts. Well, the answer the, uh, to understand that is very simple because the Jews were being shocked by their exposure to the Gentiles. And it was like, well, these people aren't living the morality that we've embraced because we had the law of Moses. So now they were then trying to impart not the law of Moses, because the law is no longer of effect. So it wasn't that they were trying to bring the Gentile nations, the Gentile believers, back under the law, it kind of appeared that way. But that's not what they were trying to do. What they were trying to do was, they were trying to bring the Gentiles under the morality that had been framed for them by the law. So when you read a lot of what you read in the writing of the apostles, uh, they are responding to things that, quite frankly, they didn't have a whole lot of exposure to. You know, and all of a sudden they're seeing stuff and they're experiencing and they're hearing stuff that is new to them. And they're like, holy mackerel, wow, this is the worst thing I ever heard. And boy, they're having a fit over it. You know, in some of the apostles' writings, literally, it's like they're having a fit over some of these things. Because it's new to them. They never. And it's funny because when you understand this, it also will help you to understand uh, a lot of what you read in the epistles. So it'll really help you to get a better grasp of why it is that the apostles were writing all the time about things that during the Lord's earthly ministry, he never said a word about. He didn't talk about divorce and marriage. He didn't talk about. Uh, incest. He didn't talk, well, he did talk about divorce or marriage. He didn't talk about incest. You know, he didn't talk about uh, um, uh, yeah, fornication as much as the apostles are found to be talking about fornication, you know. And uh, so anyway, it's just, just a little thought. So when you read the New Testament, kind of bear that in mind. Just consider, you know, these guys are are meeting people and being exposed to people who did not have the law like they did, and therefore their concept of morality was very different than the concept of morality embraced by the apostles, whose morality or their general accepted norms had been framed by the law of Moses. Okay? All right. We're going to go ahead and stop uh, this week here. I hope that you're getting some good information out of this and you feel like you're benefiting from this. Uh, next week we're going to move forward in this study and uh, I believe it will continue 
to be a great help to you. I hope it will continue to be a great help to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close. Father, once again, God, we thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the wisdom of the ages. You've given us a handbook. You've given us, Lord, direction and guidance. Lord, that not only do you provide for us the way of salvation, a way to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, but you also have given us instruction as a loving father would give his child instruction as to how to live the best life, to experience the best things, to avoid the pitfalls of conduct that can be destructive and hurtful and bring pain and sorrow and struggle into our lives. I pray, Lord, that uh, this study will somehow find its way into the deepest part of our heart. Help us to consider the information that we've heard here. And Master, today, as the truth of God penetrates our soul, let it liberate those who struggle with unnecessary condemnation and guilt. And let them today come to an understanding that every individual who will believe and obey this gospel has equal access to the kingdom and the house of our God. None are shunned and none are set aside. But you welcome all, Lord, who will approach you sincerely, openly, honestly. Master, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for this time together. Keep us in your care. Bring each and every individual back together at the next appointed time. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Want to remind you, Sunday, of course, at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time, we will be having church here in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, we have a space at the Century Office Complex or Century Office Center, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, 35801, just up the road on the opposite side of the highway from the mall over there on Memorial Parkway. Uh, you can join us live online if you don't live local, but if you live local, folks, we need you to come out and help us. We need you to come out and help us. There is a church to be born in this city that can have a wonderful, powerful impact on this town and on this state and in this nation and our country desperately needs what we're trying to do today. I hope you'll come be with us next Wednesday as well at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time as we continue our Bible study, LGBT Affirming Theology. If you have any comments or thoughts or questions, we invite you to please um, place them on our Facebook if you're watching on Facebook or on our YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. I'm happy to try to answer any questions or queries you might have. Uh, and we appreciate all the positive feedback that we can get. Until next time, God bless you. In Jesus' wonderful name is our prayer.